to share an idea, to communicate. But what is communication? Any ideas? Anyone? Shoot. No takers? Talking. That's a really good example of communication. I would define communication as the transferring of information from between or between more than one organism or even within just one organism. Now, we see communication all over the place. We see communication within humans, and that's what we're familiar with. But we also see communication within the animal kingdom. We see this in lions roaring, and dogs barking, and cats meowing. And my personal favorite is an example uh, of a bird. There's a species of bird that is chirped at at birth, and it memorizes the pitch and the pattern of that chirp, and it will repeat it to other birds and almost introduce itself like a name. And it will respond to that chirp as if being called. Now, humans can communicate in a lot of different ways. I can communicate with you in a lot of different ways right now. I can stand up straight and put my shoulders back and share with you that I'm confident and that I'm secure in my information. I can also raise my eyebrows and I can smile and show you that I'm happy and that I'm excited to be here. And most obviously, I can use my voice to share with you that my name is Marley, that I'm a grade 12 student at West Kildonan, and that I'm blonde. And these are just some examples of ways that I'm sharing information. But I didn't come here to talk about me. I came here to talk about plants. And before I can do that, I want to illustrate a very important difference between animals, like humans, and plants. And that would be tissues. Now, when I say tissues, I'm not talking about Kleenex. I'm talking about what makes us up. In the case of humans, this is skin, bones, organs, and hair. Now, plants don't have these things. I think it might be a little creepy if they did. Plants are composed mainly of something called xylem and phloem. Now, what this is, is these are transport tissues that carry water, sugars, carbon, and nutrients up and down through the plant body like elevators. And these are very, very good at doing just that. Now, plants have these tissues and they're composed of, of mainly these tissues, but what they don't have is communicative tissue, which sounds a little scary, but all that means is neurons or pain receptors or any kind of tissue that you'll find in a human brain or even in the brain of an animal. Now, what these tissues do is they're very good at not transporting nutrients or water, but transporting information. So, for example, if I took my hand and I touched a hot stove, what would happen is the pain receptors in my hand would send a signal through my arm up to my brain saying, ouch, that's hot. Don't touch that. You're causing damage. Now, if you humor me for a moment and assume that a plant could touch a hot stove, something very different would happen. Actually, nothing would happen at all. And this is because plants don't have those tissues. They can't share that information within themselves. But plants still experience things, but what could a plant possibly have to say? Plants don't have parents to report back to, and plants don't have friends to keep up with, or social media. So what could they need to say? Well, plants still experience the world. They experience bugs and changing weather conditions, and even changes in the time of day. There are certain species of plants that during the night will actually close up and then when the sun comes out, they'll open up towards the sun and face it so that they can photosynthesize. Now, because they experience things, they want to share these experiences with other parts of their plant body and potentially with other plants. But how would they go about doing that? Well, that's where these come in. These are called volatile organic compounds which is a really, really long-winded way to say plant text messages. And hear me up for a second. Because plants don't have postures they can adjust and they don't have the ability to smile or to speak, 
they've got to find some other way. So plants produce these colorless and odorless and largely invisible compounds that go right over our heads, quite literally. Now, because they're colorless and they're odorless, they're undetectable to humans for the most part, with the exception of some that do have some pleasant odors. This is what smells nice in flowers. Now, these compounds are very light, so they travel through the air quite well. Now, they're also hydrophobic, which is, again, a really complicated way of saying that they react to water the way that oil does. And what these compounds do is, if I was a plant and I had a leaf right here that was being eaten by a bug, say a little aphid or something, and then I had a, another leaf over here that wasn't, but was still in danger, well, I can't send a message through, but I've got to get the message across, so I'm going to release these airborne compounds into the air, and then they're going to touch down all over the plant body to be interpreted. And that's where the word volatile comes in. What this means is that these compounds are easily broken down and interpreted. And this also plays into the fact that they're composed of hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen and carbon mainly. Now, or organic, all that means is that they're naturally occurring. This is not something man-made. Plants are doing this themselves. Now, where did this all start? How did this happen? Where did we first see it? Well, it wasn't in these little compounds touching down in plants, and tomato plants or tobacco plants or something like sagebrush. It was actually in forests, in trees. The first place we saw this relationship between plants was in an annual symbiotic relationship, and all that means is a I scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of a relationship between spruce trees and birch trees. A spruce tree is a coniferous tree, which means it's cone bearing, and it thrives during the winter months. Now, birch trees thrive during the summer months. So what we were seeing is through the use of mushroom roots or hyphae in the soil, the spruce trees in the winter were sending sugar, carbon, and nutrients through the soil, through the roots, to the birch trees. And in the summertime, the birch trees were returning the favor, and they were sending sugars and carbon and nutrients. And we also see this in mother trees, which is a really, really, in my opinion, cute name for a very large tree in a forest that is surrounded by um, little saplings, little growing trees. And what these mother trees do is they send the same nutrients I've been talking about through the roots to these trees to help them grow. And what, this, what does this mean? Well, it means that we've all of a sudden got a conscious community of plants that are doing each other favors. So is it a community? Well, the big question is, these VOCs that plants are uh, producing and, and is transporting information, what we don't know yet, because it's still pretty new, is whether or not it's intentional. If you imagine that I'm a tomato plant and I'm working within myself and all of a sudden there's bugs, and I go, oh, there's bugs, and that's me taking the VOCs, putting them in the air, and having them touch down, Am I talking to myself and you all happen to hear me? Or do I want you to know? Do I care if you're all eaten by bugs? What research is showing is that actually I, I do because it benefits me in the long run. Now the interesting thing about these VOCs is they function like languages. And this kind of leads us more to believe that plants actually want to talk to each other. Now, if I were to say to my mother, I would like a piece of cheese with clouds, most of you would go, what the heck is that? <laughs> but I know that cheese with clouds is marble cheese, because that's what my brother used to call it when he was a little kid. And because me and my mom were in the same environment and we're very closely genetically related, we know what each other are saying. This would be like a tomato plant talking to another tomato plant that it's related to, a mother or a sister or an aunt tomato plant. Now, of course, I understand my thoughts the best. I know what I'm thinking most of the time better than anybody else. 
But what if I were to go out and speak to somebody with a heavy Scottish accent? I doubt anybody in the crowd has one. Uh, but if I were, it would be like a tomato plant speaking to a tobacco plant. They're, they're similar genetically, but there's some key differences. So when I talk to that person with the Scottish accent, some key words and key points are going to start slipping through. Some things are going to start getting missed. And you'll see this within the communication of a tomato plant versus a tobacco plant as well. Now, does anybody in the audience speak a different language? Yeah, sure, shoot. Yeah, for sure. So uh, if you could do me a favor, if you're comfortable, could you stand up and uh, say something, anything. You don't need to tell me what, so it could be as nonsensical as you like. And go ahead and, and say anything, and loud so everyone can hear you. Is it, you sure? Is there anybody else? Over here, sure, awesome. Okay, so, perfect. I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> I have no idea what you just said. Now, this would be like a tomato plant talking to a spruce tree. Very few things are gonna get across. Maybe if we were having a long discussion and I was speaking English and you were speaking a different language, maybe a word or two I'd be able to pick up and go, okay, well, that kind of sounds like a word I've heard before. And I kind of know what that is. But most things are gonna slip through. And these are these languages that plants are using. So, oh, I'm missing something. So that begs the question of what now, right? So if we've, we have these languages that plants are speaking, now, why does that matter? So what the plants are sending these text messages? Why do we care? Well, we care because we might be able to intercept them. Now, the, the largest application for this would be in the world of agriculture. So if anybody's familiar with farming a little bit, um, farmers put herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers on their crops so that they can grow. Now, these fertilizers in particular in Winnipeg are causing some pretty big problems. They're getting into our soil, and they're leaking into our waterways. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar, what they're doing is they're getting into Lake Winnipeg, and they're feeding the algae. And the algae is growing out of control. And it's stealing all of the oxygen out of the lake. And it's choking the lake. And this isn't the only negative effect of herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers. Oftentimes, if you buy fruit and vegetables from the supermarket, you'll get sick if you don't wash them because the chemicals are that dangerous. So what if there was a way around those chemicals? What if instead of putting chemicals on plants so that they could grow, we just told them that there was bugs around? If we could learn about these VOCs and decode them enough so that we could talk to plants, we wouldn't need to cover them in all kinds of growth hormones because we could just tell them to grow. And it would have huge ripple effects, not only for our own personal health, but for the health of our planet. And it's for this reason that, as silly as it may sound, I've decided to spend a good part of my time learning how to talk to plants. Thank you.